stay hungry, stay foolish. Just about to kick off part two of Smart Change with Art Markman. Before we do, I want to thank our sponsor Zai, boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded products and services, empowering businesses to manage multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease. You can check out Zai at hellozai.com. Let's get into part two of Smart Change with Art Markman. Given the structure of the habit system, there are five key tools for creating lasting behavior change. One, optimize your goals. Two, tame the go system. Three, harness the stop system. Four, manage your environment. Five, engage with others. These tools will be central to part two of Smart Change. Five tools to create new and sustainable habits in yourself and others. And we welcome back the author of this highly recommended book, Art Markman, welcome back. It's great to be back, Aiden. It's great to have you back, man. And I'm going to go straight into it because we're limited on time as we were yesterday. Art is an extremely busy man, and I'm so happy to have you and grateful for your time, Art. But let's jump straight in here because we gave all the context yesterday how we have so many challenges when it comes to creating new goals and habits, how we're born and we develop them over a period of life as opposed to new anim animals with smaller brains like deer that you gave us the example of yesterday. Also, we told people to download the Smart Change Journal on Art's website as well, and we'll give you those links again later on. But the first one that we the first toolkit that you give us is to optimize our goals. And here, you use the global obesity epidemic and the failure of most diet attempts as an example. People set the wrong kinds of goals, you tell us, when they try to lose weight. And so weight loss is a great domain for illustrating what goes wrong when people set the wrong goals and how we can be more effective at changing behavior by optimizing our goals. There are three distinctive elements that, you cr that create this storm, you tell us. One, failing to define our goals specifically. Two, focusing on outcomes instead of processes. And three, losing sight of positive goals. This section in particular, I found absolutely fascinating. Over to you, Art. No, I, I mean, a lot of times our, our attempts to change any behavior fail at the moment we define what it is we're trying to do in the first place. And, and so part of the problem is that we, we often define only the abstract thing we're trying to do. And so, you know, we say, I'm trying to lose weight. I'm, I'm trying to stop smoking. I'm trying to uh, be more effective at work. And, and the problem is there's no particular action you can take that will, that will actually help you to do that, right? I mean, what, what exactly am I going to do to lose weight? What exactly am I going to do? And, and part of the problem with this as well is, is not only do we have to worry about, about finding specific actions, but we have to be focused on things we can do. So I, I talk a lot about the fact that we need to set our goals in a positive way. And by positive, I don't mean upbeat and happy. I mean, uh, things that you can perform rather than things you're not going to do. So, so part of the problem, for example, with weight loss is we're, we're basically saying, look, we're going to eat as we always have, because you can't survive if you don't eat, but we're somehow going to eat less. And, and how, do, how exactly do you do that? I mean, we, we talked about the danger of riding the brakes, of relying on the stop system. So here we are in the middle of a meal, and then suddenly we're going to put on the brakes and say, no, no, that was the last bite. So, so you know, we, we have to actually reframe those goals and begin to think, okay, how do I turn that into something positive, a set of actions I'm going to perform. So for example, rather than saying, I'm going to somehow stop myself from eating, I can think about, well, do I want to engage in some kind of portion control before I sit down to eat in the first place? So I'm going to, I'm going to take my food from the kitchen, put it onto a plate and then, and then actually sit down and eat the, what's on my plate without having to stop myself. So I've, I've already structured the, the things so that I'm, I'm, I have a chance to be successful. So, so I have to, I have to focus on, on positive things. That, that's, that's one piece, right? I have to be specific. So thinking about creating, you know, creating my portions in the kitchen, that's a specific action that helps me to get where I want to be. And then I have to be focused on the process 
by which I live my life. Now, outcomes matter to some degree, meaning that I'd like to know what it is I'm trying to achieve. But if I only focus on those outcomes, I run the risk of engaging in unsustainable behaviors in the long term. And so I, if I focus on losing weight, then then by any means necessary, I'm going to do that. I, I may eat very badly. I may limit my calories to the point where I couldn't possibly sustain that over the long term in my life. And consequently, what I end up doing is is reaching that goal weight, perhaps, but then having reached that goal, what do I do? Well, I guess I go back to eating the way I was before, before I had that goal to lose weight. And of course, chances are that meant eating too much, which is what led me to, to need to lose weight in the first place. And so that's where you see that kind of, of decrease in weight when you're restricting your diet and then, and then an increase in weight again and moving back and forth. The alternative is to say, look, I'm going to focus on a process for living my life where as a side effect of that process, I reach the desired outcome. So if I focus on how do I eat in a healthy way, how do I eat a, a reasonable portion size, how do I eat foods that are generally nutritious, I focus on that as well as, as potential exercise and other elements. And, and basically, I don't really pay attention to the relationship between that and weight loss per se. I might weigh myself periodically in order to see if I am reaching a desired goal that I might want to, to reach. But, but basically, I'm just focused on, focused on how do I live my life. The benefit of that is that there's no point at which you've reached your goal. You're just living your life. And then it turns out you're living your life in a way that that has more long-term sustainability. And of course this this works well for things like dieting, but it it works equally well in in workplace kinds of activities. So, I mean, think about, you know, as as somebody I write, for example, I, I've written books and things like that. I have lots of colleagues who tell me, "Hey, I'd like to write a book." By which as far as I can tell what they really mean is I would like to have written a book, not so much that I'd like to write a book. And, and, and what you need to do if you're, if you're going to, to be a writer in that way is, and this is going to sound a little simplistic, but you have to write. You know, you, you, you actually have to, to set things up so that as a part of your regular routine, you write. And as a side effect of that activity, periodically a book pops out. Uh, rather than thinking I've got to get this book written, uh, where because you know the people who focus on I've got to write a book, they write they may write one book, but but when that's over, you know they they haven't really put themselves into a mindset of being a writer, whereas those people who who write, you know they they'll produce a lot of things. They will end up writing uh, not just books, but but you know, op-ed pieces and, and, uh, and, 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 you know, pieces for, for the web or for magazines or, or, or other things like that. And so they are writers and, and then other products emerge from that process. And one of those was today, I, I saw your great article in the fast company, you wrote a great article as well. So arts work is out there as well. And this process is in, in books, etc. I found found it interesting. And I, I said to myself before we came on air, because we're limited in time, Aiden, stick to the script. And I, I just can't do that, man. I can't, I, I can't do that. But I, I thought it was interesting. I thought it was important to distinguish between the brain and the mind. And then also you bring it a step farther and you explain what mindset are, because those triumphs are really important to understand. So, you know, it, one of the ways to think about this is there's lots of different ways of describing anything. And when you want to understand things, we, you bring different types of explanations to bear. And we do this across everything that we know about. This is actually something I talk about a bit in, in another book I did called Smart Thinking. But um, but if you think about the trying to understand behavior, there's there's what we could think of as the psychology level of analysis. So so when you're talking about psychology, you're basically talking about minds. And so we we can talk about habits, we can talk about motivation, goals. These are psychological concepts. But 
periodically, it is worth remembering that all of that psychology is implemented in humans in, in biology, in brains and bodies, and that it is also important to understand the structure of the brain and the circuitry of the brain, because there are times where that level of analysis of understanding brains turns out to be really useful. So for example, one of the reasons why the go system is so much more efficient than the stop system. And, and in some ways, the go system and the stop system, as I talk about them, are really about minds. But one of the reasons why uh, the, the go system is so much more efficient than the stop system is because from a brain development standpoint and from a brain evolution standpoint, that go system involves circuits that are buried very deep in the brain uh, in ways that are uh, that are similar to what we see in lots of other animals, you know, sheep, rats, uh, mice, they all have the same kinds of brain structures that are part of our go system. And, and where the, where, you know, the stop system involves these, these uh, areas of cortex, that orbitofrontal cortex, that is evolutionarily a lot newer. And, and so it, you know, you can actually see just in the structure of the brain, how, um, how these systems will differ in their overall effectiveness. And so that's a, you know, so, so there are times where it's really useful to be able to, to, to think about what, what brains are doing. And then, you know, I think, I think once you begin to understand the interplay of these things, you also begin to recognize that there are uh, a variety of, of different overall um, uh, approaches to, to, to problems, approaches to, to, to the things that you're trying to do that can have a global impact on your uh, ability to succeed. So, so for example, my, I, I had the, the pleasure of, of working at Columbia University City for five years before I came here to the University of Texas. One of my wonderful colleagues there was uh, Carol Dweck, who's done a lot of wonderful work on, on this notion of mindsets. And, and these are, are just kind of overarching ways of looking at the world that can have an influence on your likelihood of success. And, and she distinguishes between uh, what she calls in, in, po in her popular writing called, calls fixed versus growth mindsets. The idea being that, that if you have a fixed mindset, you believe that some trait that you have is immutable. You, there's nothing you can do. That's just who you are. If you have a growth mindset, then you believe that things can change, that you can adapt. And of course, with, with the brain, there are certainly capacities that we have. There are, you know, there are individual differences in overall level of intelligence there are there are you know certain individual differences but but nonetheless within each of those traits there's a tremendous amount of ability to influence those to grow and and it's and that becomes really important when we think about behavior change because if you believe that you are simply the sort of person who can't change then that is going to make it hard for you to change particularly because almost every attempt to change behavior meets with some degree of failure. And so, you know, you, you know, if you're, if you're dieting, for example, since that was the example we were using earlier, there are going to be days where you eat too much, you know, you, 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 you have, you have a, you know, you just, there's a cupcake and, and, and it looks really good. And, and next thing you know, you've eaten it. It is your response to that event that often influences your, your success overall. And if you believe you're the sort of person who can't change, so you have that kind of fixed mindset, then you take your failures and difficulties as evidence that you have reached the limit of your capacity to change. And so, and so you're prone to give up in that circumstance. But, but actually, if you believe that you can grow into a new set of behaviors, then you treat your failures and you treat difficulties as opportunities to learn. So you, you recognize, okay, I did not do the right thing in that, in this instance, I, I ate this cupcake that I really realized I shouldn't have eaten. Well, now after you, after you get some distance from that, look back on it and say, well, what, what could I have done differently? How, how might I approach this situation differently in the future than I did in the past and, and learn to grow into a different set of behaviors? And one of the other things that 
keeps me going, for example, in moments like that, and you uh, tend to in the book as well. And this is where the smart journal comes in is you need to have a bigger picture, you need to have a vision. And I often think of the the language of your why needs to be bigger than your try. So I want to have a beach body for the summer, the cupcake. Yes, it looks appealing. But I go back to my why, which is me sitting on the beach looking great and greased up and all that. <laughs> and I, <laughs> But what I didn't know, and I thought was really interesting, was when I did download the journal, you talk about what Peter Drucker distinguished as the difference between achievements and contributions. I thought this was interesting, again, a new terminology that some people, including me, may not have heard of before. Peter Drucker was such an incredibly insightful person, right? I mean, he, you know, he was working, I mean, he started working in the 1960s when almost nobody was talking about any of these kinds of things. And, and I think he had a profound influence on, on the way that people in management think about what they're trying to accomplish. And, you know, this idea between this distinction between achievements and contributions is really nice because it's this, it's this notion that there's a certain number of tasks we do on a daily basis. They're the kinds of things you can check off your to-do list and say, yep, got that done. And those are your achievements. So you might, you know, when you come home at the end of the day and you're talking to your spouse, or your partner or a friend, and, and they say, what did you do today? Uh, you generally tick off some achievements. This is, I, you know, I had this meeting and I, I finished this report off and, you know, and, and those are the kinds of things you talk about, but, but they're not the kinds of things, generally speaking, you're really proud of. So you don't, you don't get to the end of the year and say, gosh, you know, 3,800 meetings, 33,474 emails. Yeah, that was what a, what a great year. You know, we, we, when we look back over those longer periods of time, we focus on our contributions, the, the big picture things that we did. So, you know, we say, well, I, I landed these clients, I made these sales, I, I, I helped my team to, 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 uh, to, to come together to, to work on this innovative project. Those are the kinds of things that, that we really care about deeply. And, and fundamentally, the problem we have with a lot of, of, of our behavior in general is that on a day-to-day -day basis, we are focused on those achievements. And, and if we don't pay attention to how much those achievements add up to some contribution, we, we run the risk of being really busy without actually feeling like we have contributed very much. And this can be true in any sort of thing. So I, I could, you know, if, if, if I, you know, I, I may, you know, eat in a particular way, but not if I don't sometimes pay attention to my health, then I might inadvertently do things on a daily basis that are not helping me to, to achieve those health goals. And particularly in the workplace, I think this matters a ton because it's, it's so easy to get sucked into the day-to-day -day just grind of work that needs to get done without ever asking, is this really accomplishing what I was hoping it would accomplish? It's such an important aspect of any work, isn't it? Really, that really drives you. But I got to get back onto the, onto the. We're only on on number two of the toolkit, which is taming the go system. And you tell us here the crux of behavior change is that your go system currently directs you towards an undesired behavior. The undesired behavior gets energized by the environment, which we'll talk about in a little while, and that arousal triggers old habits. To allow the new behavior to take shape, you have to start by creating an implementation intention. I love how you put this next line. We can then use this implementation intention as scaffolding to energize a new behavior until we have repeated it off enough for a habit to emerge. I'll let you take it from there. It's such a wonderful uh, concept from psychology. This is actually, there's a great psychologist in New York called Peter Golwitzer. He, he's, he and his colleagues have done a lot of work on this notion of implementation intentions. And the idea is that if I can be very specific about the actions that I want to perform, this has two benefits. One of which is, well, it actually has a lot of benefits, but the first two benefits are um, it, I, if I'm specific enough in thinking about it, it helps me to be reminded to do that action when I'm in the circumstance, because I'm actually thinking through what is the environment going to look like. So that's part of that scaffolding. It also, for particularly in the workplace, where so much of our lives are driven by the things that are on our calendar, 
you know, we, we, we have, you know, these days, you know, Outlook and Google, the, you, you have your calendar and it's got all these little boxes on it. When something makes it onto your calendar, it's much more likely that it's going to get done because you're using that, that calendar to, as, as, a, as another scaffold. So, so being specific enough that you can get it on the calendar is extraordinarily important. And the other thing that, that being that specific does is it forces you to grapple with all of the resource trade-offs. So so, you know, one of the one of the problems we have is um, we're already busy. We've already got a ton that we're doing, and so if I'm going to add a different behavior in, it's got to it's got to land on my calendar somewhere. And chances are that means it's got to displace something else. And so then I have to deal with okay, how am I gonna how am I gonna handle what 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 is missing? Am I gonna stop doing that? And if I'm going to stop doing that, particularly in the workplace, do I have to get permission for that? So do I have to sit down with my boss and say, okay, look, I, I need to make progress on this particular contribution. Can I remove some of the rest of this from my plate? And for those of your listeners, and I think there are many who, who, who really are the boss in, in, in a lot of ways, then, then it actually requires, and I was having this conversation actually with, with somebody the other day who's in a, a leadership role, you got to learn to delegate. You know, what, one, of the, one of the reasons that delegation becomes so important is because we have this tendency to continue doing things that really lots of other people could do, and we're not making use of our own unique accomplishments. And so, you know, the, the problem with delegating is we tend to do it only when we need to do it. And I, I, I've written a lot about uh, this, that you, one of the things you have to do is to constantly be teaching other people how to do your job. Uh, that, that should just be a regular part of your work, bringing, ride, letting people ride along with you to client meetings, you know, uh, getting people to, to, to write drafts of things that, that, that ultimately they may need to take over. If you're always teaching other people to do your job, then it never feels bad to delegate because because in some ways you you you've already structured the work environment so that other people can do the stuff that you do and and most people you know just need to remember the old adage that if if you can't be replaced you can't be promoted that ties beautifully to what you said about Carol Dweck because the fixed mindset sticks to that which is like I'll protect what I'm known for etc because I can't grow as well but th there's an important adjunct to this because once you've imp implemented or created your implementation intention you have to grapple with the many obstacles that we face and again you tell us that we can preempt these because when we preempt them they come along like for example the buffet when I'm trying to lose weight and when it comes along, I knew you were coming, I'm ready for you, and you have a plan ready to go. No, it's, it's absolutely right. You know, I think a lot of people, you know, you know think I, I just, I have to think positively. I have to focus on, on you know, the, my success. And yeah, it's important to believe that you can succeed. There is a certain amount of self-fulfilling prophecy that comes with this, but, but you don't believe that you can succeed because you ignore the obstacles. It's it's that you actually address them head on. So a lot of us have this finely honed tendency to, 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 to talk ourselves out of uh, behavior change by, by saying, well, here's, here's all the reasons why it's not going to succeed. So I'm just not going to do it. And, and what I recommend is, is go through that first half of the process that is, that is identify the obstacles, but then actually plan for them, be ready for them. And, and, and you're not going to envision every single obstacle, but the more that you can grapple with and think about how you're going to deal with, the better, so that you're not stuck in a situation in which an obstacle arises and you're utterly unprepared. So you, you mentioned the buffet, right? So that's the bane of, of, of every business person's existence when you go to some event and you, you've been trying to watch your eating and then suddenly there's this mountain of food. And so I recommend having a plan for that buffet before you come in. One of the, one of the things I suggest there is, you know, so, so first of all, while everybody else rushes to the buffet line, find a table really far away from where the food is. And, and so, you, so you've already identified where you're going to sit. And now everybody else is all lined up. Now, now I tell people, go to the dessert cart, uh, if you can, where they, where they hide the smaller plates so that you don't pick the biggest plate possible that you're going to fill with food. Because it's, you know, a lot of, a lot of this eating is ultimately about portion control. Now, now, the advantage of waiting this long 
is that that all the food's now been picked over. So it doesn't look nearly as appetizing it does as it does when it's fresh off the cart. Now, now fill up your tiny little plate with whatever it is that you that, that looks appetizing for you. You know, eat that. Um, and and you've wasted enough time now that by the time you finish that, the uh they're probably clearing the buffet away. And so, and so now you've survived another day. And 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 the idea there is just you know, whatever, however you choose to handle something like that, the idea is I thought about it a little bit in advance. So I knew what I was going to do. And then I can just engage that plan rather than thinking I've got to figure out on the fly how to deal with this. And, and that's just, you know, it, the more that, that you can feel like you are working in familiar territory, the easier that that behavior change is ultimately going to be. That's the, go system but then we have to tame the stops or so we have to harness the stop system and we touched on this the last episode art and the the stop system you tell us is much less efficient than the go system and we touched on this because of ego depletion that we talked about the last day as well we run out of literally fuel for that stop system because it's actually more draining on our energy etc and it also can be influenced for the negative by stress, fatigue, alcohol, or even overuse. I'd love you to take us through this. So you know, we you know just a just a quick summary of where we were la- of, of some of the stuff we talked about last time. You know, that because that stop system is evolutionarily newer, um, it it is it is a lot less efficient, and so and so a lot of things will get in the way. All the things that you mentioned. So so yeah if i'm stressed out you know i may find myself just doing things that i that i didn't you know that i don't want to do and a lot of times what i'll do is i'll say well I, you know what i'll just i'm just going to give in today it's you know i i will decide that that achieving that goal really isn't as important as i keep saying it is and so part of what we want to do is to find ways to bolster that and there are there are several things that we can do and these will we'll talk about some of these a little bit more as we explore some of the other tools but you know having a buddy is really helpful so so you know if i you know a lot of people when when as when they exercise they're prone to just not do it you know you 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 know it's time for you to exercise and you're like oh, i'm tired had a long day i really don't feel like doing this and it's easy to tell yourself you know what i'm just going to skip it today but but suppose that you agree to meet several friends to exercise. Well, now you're not just tell, you know, you don't just have to tell yourself. Now you have to tell your friends, and that's harder to do. And your friends have permission to nag you, and so suddenly you find yourself doing it. I mean, I I I have started cycling, uh, and I have a, a group that I get together with on weekends. And so you know, it's it's if I wake up and I'm a little tired on Sunday morning. Uh, I, it's really hard for me to tell my friends that I've agreed to meet somewhere. Yeah, you know what? I'm really not going to do it. That's that's just not nice. So so I you know it makes sure that I get out. Um, you know another thing that you can do is 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 you know for example in, let's let's stick with the exercise theme for a second is is to lower the barrier the lower the bar a little bit. So one of the other things that happens is you think to yourself, I really I really don't feel like exercising today. So you know what? Just just to just decide to do it for 10 minutes. You know what? I, I, I don't want to do an hour of exercise. I'm too tired. I'll just, I'm just going to exercise for 10 minutes. I think I can get myself to do that. And, and now the, and it notice again, it's a positive action, right? I'm going to do this for 10 minutes. And the beauty of it is once you get into it, then, then you forget why you didn't want to do it in the first place. And you, you end up doing your full exercise routine. This by the way, works also uh, for, for one of the fun trade-offs between short-term and long-term goals, which is something that I used to call the Netflix effect. Back in the day when when you ordered movies on Netflix and then they'd get sent home, there were always a certain number of movies that you believed you should watch, you know, documentaries or things like Schindler's List, you know. And so you see it, you you would see it on the on the website. You'd think, yeah, I should get that. And you'd put it on your queue. Uh, And then it would arrive home you know, and you'd have, you'd always have like three DVDs from Netflix at home. And you'd, and, and, and what would happen is there would be no, in, there would be no day in which you wanted to watch the movie because you're thinking, well, it might be boring or sad or uncomfortable. And so, and so it would just sit at home for a long time. But if you actually sit down and watch a documentary, generally speaking, they're really good. You know, and and particularly the ones that that make it out enough for us to see them. And so I, I tell people the same thing. I say, look, just 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 to just watch ten minutes of 
of it. You don't like it, shut it off. And, and the beauty again is 10 minutes in, usually you're hooked, right? So just to lower that bar a little bit. And, and so I, you know, the more of that, that you, that you do about thinking about, okay, how do I, how do I get myself into the action? right is you know that's really important because what i'm what i'm really trying to do is is to is to engage more of the right actions and to then bolster myself as much as possible against doing the wrong stuff so having having people there you know we'll talk a little bit more about the environment but of course the environment plays a huge role as i as i like to say you know when i was losing weight i learned the valuable lesson that if you want to stop eating ice cream uh, you can't eat an ice cream that's not in your freezer. And, and so, you know, if you don't buy it, then, then, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to eat it. And, and then at nine 30 at night, when you're prone to sit down with that pint of ice cream and a spoon, uh, if it's not there, you're probably not going to wander out in your pajamas, uh, to get to the grocery store to buy that ice cream. So it, you know, you, 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 you've, you've protected yourself from yourself. Yeah, and it's the same for the gym, for example, for me, the gym is part of my routine on my way to work. So I have to, you know, I can't pass by it unless the, the guilt and the, you know, that vision starts kind of going, what about me? So, but but environment can be positive and negative, as you say, because it can prime us and trigger us to certain things. So I'd love to talk about that next. That's number four, supporting new behaviors, creating habits and blocking temptations all by manipulating your environment. Yeah, no, it's the environment is such a powerful part of the way that we do things. And and so, you know, I, I, was, I was joking a little bit when we were talking on the last show about about my email. You know, if, if I have my email program up and, and I can see that new emails have come in, it becomes really hard to do anything else because, because it's right there in my environment on the screen. And so, and so, you know, it creates these kinds of temptations. The, the, the general principle that you're trying to create uh, both for yourself and if you're trying to influence other people's behavior is to make desirable behaviors easy and undesirable behaviors hard. So if, if you can make it easy to do the right thing, then people are more likely to do the right thing. And, and, and you know, we talk about that in, in business. We talk about that a lot when, we're, when we talk about trying to reduce friction for certain things. So, you know, if you're trying to influence purchase behavior, you do things like what, what Amazon did when they, when they instituted one-click shopping. Right. You know, the idea is if, if I can reduce the number of steps you need to take in order to to do the thing I want you to do, I can make it more likely for you to do that. Now, you, when you're trying to influence your own behavior, have to look at that environment and say, is that what I want? Do I want to make it easy for my for, for me to to impulse buy things? And if not, you know, do I want to actually structure my environment to make certain things more difficult to do? And and so. I I want to I want to be able to manipulate my own environment in that way and so I want to put reminders of positive behaviors uh, out there in the environment visibly for me to engage with and I I would like to 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 move aside all of the reminders and 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 triggers for the undesirable behaviors as much as possible and and the other thing that's important is, you know, we talked a little bit yesterday uh, uh, as we were talking about habits, about uh, about the fact that these habits are triggered by the environment. And so if you're trying to disrupt some habits, uh, you know, mess up that consistent mapping between the environment and the behavior. So, uh, you know, since we're talking a lot about eating behavior today, um, you want to you wanna make it harder for you to engage your habits in your kitchen rearrange your kitchen move move the move move the the silverware and the and the dishes around the kitchen because now you can't mindlessly grab a spoon and a bowl you you actually have to think about wait where where did i put everything and that moment's pause now creates an opportunity to do things in a in a somewhat different way so so you can really you know play around with your uh, with your environment in ways that that can make desirable behaviors easy, but also disrupt your habits sometimes in ways that then can cause you to rethink some of the things that you're doing. So, you know, I um, 
in, in an earlier part of my life when I was I was trying to to, to lose weight, one of the other things I did was uh, I became a vegetarian. And and part of the reason for doing that was that by by creating a different approach to the way I was eating, it forced me to rethink all of the different kinds of meals that I was having. And, and that created a new opportunity to do things in a different way. And that maps back to what we talked about yesterday as well. New environment is uncomfortable. It's going to be uncomfortable at the start. I think that's one of the things I really want to get through to our audience is any kind of change is going to increase discomfort. It's part of any type of change. You got to expect it. You got to expect the obstacles, etc. But I wanted to also remind our audience, anytime Art's talking about you as an individual, also think about the organization in which you're driving change, the exact same principles count. And I wanted to bring it then to those people who are maybe working on new products or innovating or a startup bringing a new product to market. You give a great example of PNG sense stories in the book, and also talking about making it easy for people, making it difficult for something that you don't want to do, but making it easy for people if you want to encourage a behavior. And this could count for products as well. I, I love product failures. Uh, as stories, because often they are really instructive in important ways. And I did do a lot of work uh, with P&G as a consultant for, for a long time. And one of my favorite product failures from them, and that's like, they're a company that's been monumentally successful in so many ways, but so I, don't, I, I hate to pick on them, but but they had a product that was actually really cool that was called Scent Stories. And the idea behind Scent Stories was there was this little disc, sort of looked sort of like a CD, and it and it had scent on it. And because you acclimate to a scent fairly quickly, you know, like you'll walk into a room, you'll smell something nice, and then and then it goes away. It's not that the scent itself has gone away. It's it's actually that you habituate to it, so you don't notice it anymore. So they they recognize that. So what they did was these discs would play a scent story, like a walk through the woods, and so and so it would start out by by you know. Some, some, some flowers, and then you might smell some pine, and then you might smell, you know, some other, you know, botanical thing. And it would, and it would change about every five minutes over the course of a half hour. And it would, and you'd keep noticing it. And it was, it was, it was actually, and it was, it the technology was cool. And it, it was, it was a really cool idea, but chances are, you've never heard of this because it, it, no one has one. Uh, they they actually, as I recall, they actually ended up having to give away a bunch of them to the to employees in their Christmas gift bag because they just couldn't sell them. But the reason why was because the little discs looked like CDs, so they actually made the the um, the device itself that played this scent. They made it look like a little CD player, and it was it was techy and not real attractive and. I, what they what they didn't really think about was where are people going to put this thing? Like it 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 was not the sort of thing you'd want to put like right out there in your kitchen, or or in some other public place. I mean, your 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 stereo equipment sits in a cabinet somewhere, and so it just wasn't out and available for people to re to remember. Oh yeah, let me stick a disc in that and press press the play button and get it you know and get it to play some scent. They, they had all sorts of design choices here. They certainly could have put it in, uh, in, in something shaped like a planter. And, and if they had done that, if they, if, they, if they made it something that was attractive that might actually sit out on a counter, it might have been much more successful. And one reason to think it might be more successful is actually a parallel story about uh, Febreze, which is another P&G product. And Febreze is a... Um, is it, the, the, the central active ingredient in Febreze is a chemical that binds to odorants, that binds to the things that actually make you smell stuff. Um, and, and so the idea was, you know, you, 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 if you had a bad smell in your house, you could spray this stuff and then you wouldn't smell it anymore because, because none of the molecules that cause that, that smell would be available for your nose. Uh, the earliest versions of this product were, everyone thought it was great. Everyone thought it worked really well. They had a hard time selling it. And there were, there were several reasons why this was true. But one of the most important was that when they first made Febreze, they, they marketed it in, by selling it in bottles that looked a little bit like window cleaner bottles. 
you know, the, 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 the sort of, you know, tank with the, with the little, you know, trigger on it. And, and those bottles are ugly. And, and most of us have a habit associated with those bottles, which is to stick them in, in the, in the cabinet under the sink with all the rest of the cleaning supplies. And so the problem was people would only use it when they were cleaning, they would sort of stick it in that bucket with all the things. And then when they, and they would refresh the house once a week or whatever, when they cleaned, but they wouldn't use it very often. And so everyone loved the product. They agreed it worked, but they weren't using it enough to drive sales. And they redesigned the bottles. And so, and so the bottles eventually became these much small, smaller, rounded bottles, usually with prints on the outside of flowers and stuff like that, that you could actually stick out on a counter or, or somewhere in a, in a more visible spot. And once they were out, people started using them more often. And, and so then they had to repurchase them more often and, and sales grew pretty significantly. So the idea is, you know, think a little bit about how do you get yourself into people's environments and into the environment in which they're going to use your product or engage with you so that you can actually be a part of their life and drive that behavior. It was such a valuable lesson that one I, I thought it made me think about and then I started to see it everywhere. And I was thinking about like Nespresso pods, and the way they sell actually the containers to hold them, they're all visible, and they're all designed to be out in your counter again to drive usage, really important aspect of, of innovation as well. Because we talked about scent there, I thought also how, for example, you mentioned writing, I do a lot of writing, I do a lot of reading. And I like the environment to be right. And as you rightly recognize the last day, I was in a new studio, I was still finding my feet a little bit uncomfortable, etc. But one of the things that we're probably unconscious of many times is the pheromones, the smells in our environment. And I thought that's where you're going with scent stories was actually you can use these to trigger a certain type of thought or a certain way of being as well. And that's also really important priming because this goes to the last chapter of the book where you talk about group change as well, because even, you know, writing on the wall and the type of mission statements you have, all that stuff has a, a dramatic impact on environment. You know, and, and it's interesting from a from a, uh, a scent stand standpoint, a lot of the benefits that smells have seems to run through the emotional uh, triggers that scents create. So, so smells are, smells are actually there, you know, most of us are not particularly good at describing the smells that we, you know, we can say, well, it sounds, smells sort of like flowers or, or, you know, it smells sort of, you know, whatever it is, you know, but we don't, we, we don't have a very finely tuned sense of, of how to talk about them, but we often have feelings that come along with particular smells. We, we smell, you know, popcorn and it, and it reminds us of, of the joy of being at the movies or a fair or something like that. And so um, <clears throat> having, having smells that create a mood that is conducive to the work that we're trying to do is, is really valuable. Uh, and, 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 you know, I think setting up environments that are comfortable when we're trying to to put people at ease but maybe a little bit you know putting people on edge sometimes when we're when we're trying to create some energy for people that that matters too you know i think we talk about wanting to be comfortable but you know you don't you don't always want to be too comfortable right Some, sometimes you actually want people to be leaning forward and really you know digging into the to the work that they're doing and so i you know i i think that that really thinking through how how is the environment making us feel? How is it, you know, is it, is it creating, uh, uh, is it making it easy to work as a team? You know, do I have surfaces to write on? You know, do I, do I feel like I have to be very protective of that environment? You know, one of the problems with, with having a brand new office building, for example, is that everybody's afraid to put the first scratch in something. And so people are treating everything really gingerly. I sort of feel like if you want to break in a new workspace, you know, you should walk around and just scratch things up a little bit so that people feel like, oh yeah, I can just, I can just plop my stuff down. I don't have to, I don't have to be too careful here, right? I can just dig in and make this, you know, make this part of my work. I was really conscious of that during COVID when we had to work from home and I was, I had to remind myself, this is my children's, this is my family's home and I don't want to make it work and as in a workplace, because it's their home, and I don't want to spoil it for them, because they've honed it over years, etc. But the final part, I thought we, we get onto this, Aiden, move on, is uh, that how important other people are, 
as a source of activation for our goals. You say our environment and the people around us as the environment as well are great sources of scaffolding for new behaviors. And you say we are more likely to be motivated when we see people around us pursuing a goal. There's a lot of evidence that goals are contagious. So when you see someone pursuing a goal, you would automatically engage in that same behavior yourself. You mentioned an example of dropping papers in a hotel lobby and the goal contagion that aroused as a result of that. We are, we're a social species. We, when we watch other people do things, part of what we're doing is, is trying to understand not just what are they doing, but why are they doing it? And part of the way that we do that is actually by running that action through our own motivational system, which then has the added influence of making us more likely to do the same thing, which is wonderful when you want to create cooperative behavior. And so the story I was telling was I had gone to a, a hotel to give a talk and it was, you know, I was going to give my talk and then I, and then, and then get in my car and leave. And I, I had to, uh, and so, and so I checked out of my room and I had my, I had my little suitcase on wheels and I had a box of materials with me and I had some books and I just, I had all this stuff. And, and, I just, I couldn't get myself to make two trips to the car. I had to find a way to carry everything all at once. And I was just, everything was really precariously balanced. And I was standing on this escalator from the, the kind of conference uh, floor of a hotel down into the lobby. And, and suddenly something shifted and I tried to catch everything. And the next thing, I, you know, the, the disaster that was waiting to happen just happened. And the box that had all these loose papers in it fell. And I suddenly there was just this shower of, of you know, materials that I <laughs> put in the box that was all over the place. And, and, and a, a, somebody standing in the lobby in a suit saw what, what happened and immediately rushed over to the base of the escalator and started gathering papers up. And suddenly three or four or five other people saw him go do this and they all walked over. By the time I got to the bottom of the escalator, they had gathered all the papers up and put them in a nice little pile, meaning that I had learned not learned my lesson at all. <laughs> <laughs> By the time I got to the bottom, what I learned was, you know what, it's okay if you if you end up making a mess and dropping everything because somebody else is going to save you. But but it was such a beautiful example of that kind of goal contagion. And it, you know, generally speaking, I mean, in, in your personal life, hang out with people who are doing the stuff you want to do. So, you know, it's one of the reasons why going to the gym is so effective, or or in Austin, Texas, uh, we have a we have a beautiful trail around the the, the lake. That's that's uh, that's it's actually the the lower Colorado River that's that's been dammed up uh, just just east of town, and so we have a, a, a lake there, and and the trail just always has people running and walking and biking, and you just can't sit still when you go there. You you have to do that, but but it also means that in the workplace. Um, you know, I always tell people when you're when you're trying to influence other people's behavior, when you've asked for something repeatedly and you're not getting what you want, that it's really critical to remember that in every organization, there's what you say, what you do and what you reward. And everyone in the organization is listening to those in reverse order. So actually, they don't care much about what you say. What they really want to know is what are other people doing uh, and then what's being rewarded. You know, I, you know, they, they, people are paying attention to who, who's getting promoted, who's getting opportunities, who's getting thanked, but they are also looking for, are people visibly doing the thing that you say you wanted? And so, so creating opportunities for other people to see their, their colleagues engaging in this desirable behavior turns out to be a really important part of influencing the behavior of the people that you're working with. And, and so, you know, I think that, that goal contagion is powerful. And of course, you know, the other thing that's powerful that we talked about a little bit the other day is, is teaching, right? So, 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 you know, the main adaptation of humans is that we're really good at learning from everybody else around us. And, and that means that, that we need to be uh, teaching others. And when we're trying to change our own behavior, learning from others, we need to, we need to find people, in fact, teams of people to mentor us, to teach us how to do the things that we don't know how to do, to make visible to us the skills that we're not even aware we're going to need for that next job. You know, one of the things that happens in the workplace is, you, you know, you, you, you often have only a, a vague sense of what the next 
promotion would entail because you're you're busy doing your own job so you 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 don't necessarily realize all the things that the next level up is doing and and so it's really important to actually just ask you know so so what does your day look like and and how can i learn more about how that works so that you can be better prepared for that next career phase rather than you know being thrown into the pool on the deep end and you know with 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 the hope that you might be able to discover a swim stroke Absolutely fantastic art. And I'm aware of your time has come to an end. I highly recommend the book, particularly for those people working in transformation roles or change roles. The last chapter has eight toolkits itself for group change as well, which we won't have time to go through today. Art, again, we mentioned, for example, the Smart Change Journal, people can go to your website, find that where can they find that? So the Smart Change Journal available as a download on my website, which is smartthinkingbook.com. There's a tab there for the book Smart Change. And under that is, is a link to the Smart Change Journal. So you can, you can check that out. And uh, there's resources related to some of my other books there as well. And hopefully we'll have Art back to discuss some of those books. They're absolutely magnificent. Brain and work, uh, brain beliefs, lots of magnificent content there as well. And as I mentioned as well, Art just did a great article on Fast Company about feedback and how to give feedback also covered in this book as well. Art, the author of Smart Change, five tools to create new and sustainable habits in yourself and in others. Art Markman, thank you for joining us. And it was absolutely a pleasure. I want to thank our sponsor Zai before we finish up boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded products and services empowering businesses to move funds with ease and manage multiple payment workflows you can check out Zai at hellozai.com I'll see you next week